Now that we have a feel for what subgroups are, let's take a look at their closely related cousins, the cosets. Now what is a coset? The coset is what we get when we take a subgroup of a group, so we have a group G and a subgroup H, and a coset is obtained just by taking every element of that subgroup and multiplying it by some element of G. But because our groups need not be abelian, we might get a different result if we multiply on the left versus if we multiply on the right. So the left cosets will be the result of multiplying every element from our subgroup H by an element G on the left, and the right cosets will consist of the subgroup H multiplied by element G on the right. So kind of think of these as acting like subgroups. They look an awful lot like subgroups, but they're just shifted in the sense that they need not contain the identity element anymore. We'll see what that means by an example in a second. So let's take the subgroup that we looked at uh, in the last video, the subgroup consisting of the even integers modulo 12, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Call that H. So what does a coset of this subgroup look like? Well, suppose I take an element from G, let's say the number 1, and I add it to this subgroup on the left. In other words, I'm going to take, instead of 0, 2, 4, 6, and 8, I'm going to take 1 plus 0, 1 plus 2, 1 plus 4, and so on. And what I get is this collection of elements, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11, which is now a coset. Note that it's not a subgroup. It's just a coset, because it's not closed under addition. 1 plus 3 is not an element of this set. It doesn't contain the identity, and it doesn't contain, well, it does contain inverses, but we really don't care, right? So it's not a subgroup, but it is a coset. We've just taken the elements 0 through 10, and we just kind of rotated them around the clock by one hour. Here was a left coset, because I added 1 on the left, but because Z12 is an abelian group, I get the same result if I add 1 on the right instead. Another thing that you'll notice is that if we take and look at adding 2 instead of adding 1 to our original subgroup, well, 2 plus 0, 2 plus 2, 2 plus 4, and so forth, actually ends up giving me the very same coset H back that we started with, the very same subgroup, actually. Why is this the case? Well, it's natural because 2, this element that I'm adding into my subgroup, is already an element of the subgroup to begin with. So since H was a subgroup and 2 belonged to H, adding 2 to every element of H just gives me H again. So cosets are really only interesting when they're generated by some element that comes from outside of the original subgroup. In fact, if we take another look at this, 2 plus h, 4 plus h, 6 plus h, 8 plus h, and 10 plus h, those are all the same thing as one another. Likewise, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. If I add those to h, I end up getting the same subgroup every time. So in fact, there are only two different subgroups for this entire group Z12 and the subgroup H. Right? These are the only cosets sorry, of H that exist in Z12. This has a bit of terminology associated with it. We say that the index of the subgroup H in the group Z12 is equal to 2, because we have only two different cosets that are possible to associate to H. And the notation we use for that has a little colon in it, so Z12 colon H is the index of the subgroup H in the larger group Z12. Moreover, in a little bit, we're going to talk about quotient groups. And here in this example, the quotient group, Z12, quotiented out by the subgroup H, turns out to have just two elements in it, one element coming from the coset on the left, 0 plus H, and the other element coming from the coset on the right, 1 plus H. So it remains to be seen why that quotient actually is a group, in what sense it's a group. Uh, we'll see that in the next set of videos. Let's take another a little bit more comprehensive look at what cosets might look like in a non-abelian group. Let's return to S4 and the subgroup H, which consists of the subgroup, cyclic subgroup generated by 1, 2, and 3, 4. So this was the subgroup of order 4 uh, that was in our previous example. So here are examples of some cosets. This one gets kind of hairy, again, because S4 is not abelian. So let's suppose I take the coset generated by 1, 2 on the left. So what does this coset look like? We're just going to compose 1, 2 on the left by every element in H and then simplify what we have here. But when we simplify these things, we find out that what we get back is just H itself again. Duh, because 1, 2 is an element of the subgroup H, operating on H on the left by one of those elements just gives me the same subgroup back again. Where it gets interesting is if I operate with a different element from outside of the subgroup, say 1, 3. If I operate on H on the left by 1, 3, and then I simplify everything I have, what I end up with is a set of three elements in S4, which none of which came from the subgroup H. In fact, they come from outside of H. And what's interesting about this example is it turns out that if I operate by 1, 3 on the right of H instead of on the left of H, and then I simplify, then actually the result turns out to be different. 
In other words, the left coset generated by 1, 3 and the right coset generated by 1, 3 on the subgroup H are not the same as one another. They consist of the same number of elements, but the elements themselves are actually different. So a valid question here is, well, how many cosets of this particular H are there inside of S4? In other words, what is the index of this subgroup H inside of the group S4? The most brutal way to do that is to just try listing them all. So let's list the left cosets and the right cosets of H when we operate on them by various sets of elements. Naturally, if I operate on them by the elements of H themselves, I get just H. Then we also looked at the left coset generated by 1, 3. Then there's the left coset generated by 1, 4. The left coset generated by 2, 3. The left coset generated by 2, 4. And last but not least, the left coset generated by the product of 1, 3, and 2, 4. And since each of those left cosets has four elements in it, what we end up with is that each of those four elements in a given coset generates the same coset as each other. So we find out that we have a total of six left cosets of the subgroup H. Then we look at the right cosets. Again, if I operate on the right by one of the elements that was originally in H, I'm just going to get H again. If I operate on the right by any one of these other elements, 1, 3, 1, 4, 2, 3, 2, 4, and 1, 3, 2, 4, I end up getting distinct right cosets again. And again, because each right coset is going to have four elements in it, and operating by one of those elements is going to give me the same right coset as operating by any other one of those elements, we again get a total of six right cosets arranged into groups of four. So there are six right cosets. So it turns out that we have the same number of left cosets as we have right cosets for this subgroup H, but the cosets themselves are a little bit different. They consist of different elements in them. The left cosets and the right cosets don't always match up. It turns out that when the left and right cosets do match up exactly, in other words, they have not only the same number of elements, but the same elements, that's a special case that we're going to call H a normal subgroup in our next set of lectures. So the next thing we need to do is sort out how to compare one group to another group by looking at the concept of a homomorphism. Homomorphisms are going to be the most important tool that we have to connect one group to another group. And in the next video, we're going to look at all the different kinds of homomorphisms that are out there and what they can do for us.